Welcome. A short distance from this theater is historic Fort Moultrie, where you will have a unique opportunity to trace the little-known story of coastal defense in the United States. The changes of more than a century and a half, expressed in fortifications and weapons, have been preserved here by the National Park Service. Your visit will be much enhanced by following the distinctive tour markers as you walk back in time from the Second World War to the American Revolution. One final word. For your safety, please observe the regulations posted along the way. A fort can be hazardous, even in peacetime. And now, the story of Fort Moultrie. The end of every other branch of the art of war is to destroy, oppress, and enslave. The end of fortification is to preserve, to resist, and to protect. Fort Moultrie looks small and sort of ineffective now, doesn't it? A string of forts like this, some big, some small, protected 3,000 miles of our coast. Fort Moultrie shows almost 200 years of changes brought about by many things, military, social, and economic. quite as hectic as it was during World War II. This was a joint Army-Navy Harbor Command post that controlled all the ship movements in and out of the port of Charleston. You know, the history of coastal defense is a story that goes a long way back, right back to the American Revolution. And you can trace it for almost 200 years right here at Fort Moultrie. what it was like here in 1776 for an artillery sergeant like myself. Those damn checkers, how many times have I told them about this? Damn it. We were hard by it with England. Why, the British were no more than 400 yards off this beach, and we drove them back. We let our bulldogs bark, we did. Bunch of kings, bad bargains, they turned out to be. Uh, you won't see them back in the Carolina soon. There are a few other forts scattered up and down the coast in the other colonies, uh, states. But it's not going to be enough to win the war. Why, to protect the port of Charleston, we built this fort here on Sullivan's Island in six months. I, if I might say so, it's a lovely piece of business. But let me show you something. This fort is constructed with palmetto logs, two rows of them filled with dirt between. And we used palmetto logs because that's all we had. It turned out to be a great advantage. You see, palmetto has this fiber which absorbs the shock of the balls without splintering. Now follow me, I'll show you something else. We're ideally located. We sit at the harbor entrance, close by the main ship channel. 
Any vessel coming into the port of Charleston comes within range of these guns. It takes my five lads to fire this gun, and they do a good job of it. Designed to garrison 1,000 men, the still incomplete fort was challenged by a British squadron in June 1776. 300 determined men under Colonel William Moultrie using muzzle-loading cannon turned back the British fleet. It was one of the first American victories of the Revolutionary War, frustrating British attempts to invade the South. The British returned in 1780. This time, they bypassed Fort Moultrie. Landing to the south, they lay siege to Charleston. It fell, and Cornwallis invaded the southern colonies. Although victorious at first, the British marched to defeat at Yorktown nearly two years later. Our palmetto logs stood up well to the British cannon, but not to the coastal storms. Last year, when His Excellency General Washington came to visit here, there was nothing left, just what you see. Islanders had carted off what the storms hadn't destroyed. Now I hear we're not alone. Everywhere up and down our coast, the forts are in a sad state. The government says we're at peace, but I don't trust the British, or the Frenchies for that matter. Up to no good, if you ask me. I read just last week that uh, President Washington is demanding action from Congress to protect our coast. Our new nation needs new forts as you can plainly see. After all, nobody's gonna do it for us. European turmoil threatened to involve the young republic. Begun in 1794, the first system of American forts was crude by European standards. Mostly earthworks with some masonry, they featured one open tier of guns. They included a second Fort Moultrie which was completed in 1798. This fort was swept away by a hurricane six years later. A third Fort Moultrie was finished in 1809 as part of the so-called second system of coastal forts. Brick and masonry filled with earth, it boasted 40 guns. Completed and ready, Fort Moultrie's guns stood unchallenged during the War of 1812. storm last night. Had to check the powder magazine. Still high and dry. Uh, old timers say this magazine was built before the war of 1812. Uh, I was just a wee lad then. It's been almost 30 years now. Ah well, during that war, the British thought they owned our coastline. They burned Washington City, the capital mine, just so easily, well, that we needed more and better forts. What am I standing here telling you all about it for? Let me show you what we're doing. Ah, there she is, Fort Sumter. 
is going to be one of the best of our new forts. Ah, ain't she a beauty? You know, these new brick and granite forts are more elaborate and expensive than anything we've had before. They've got enclosed gun rooms and as many as four tiers of guns. The guns are bigger, as you might imagine. Fort Sumter was started in 1829 to complement Fort Moultrie as part of the third system of forts. These sister forts were to provide a crossfire at the harbor entrance. The day after Christmas, 1860, the small federal garrison at Moultrie was moved to Fort Sumter to avoid imminent capture by southern forces. After the Yankees sneaked over to Sumter, our boys moved into Moultrie. We gave those confounded Yankees three months to go home. They left Moultrie, but they wouldn't leave Sumter. We were forced to fire on them. They made a gallant defense for 34 hours, but under our relentless fire, they were obliged to surrender, and the Confederate States of America controlled Charleston Harbor. As the war continued, the Union fought to regain many of the coastal forts, and these often became a factor in controlling the sea routes, which supplied the South. Changes in warfare came quickly. Ironclads like the Monitor and Merrimack virtually scuttled the world's wooden fighting ships. After 1863, Forts Sumter and Moultrie had to cope with these new steam-powered armored vessels and rifled artillery. The Confederates tried strengthening their forts with sand and earthworks. They developed their own rifled artillery and began using underwater mines for harbor defense. We learned a lot of lessons from the late rebellion. We were firing on Fort Sumter for a year and a half. We blew that fort away tier by tier, but the Rebs kept covering the rubble with earth, and by the time we finished, they had a better fort than when we started. The more we knocked it down, the stronger it got. So, after the war, when we put Fort Moultrie back together, we kept the walls low, built concrete magazines, and covered them over with earth used our heaviest guns and spread them out. I yep, we learned a lesson from those Rebs. What was needed was fresh thinking about our coastal defenses, new concepts, designs, guns. Eventually, in 1885, a presidential commission called the Endicott Board, searching for fresh ideas about coastal defense, developed a new system. All right, let's sum things up. This is Charleston Harbor. Here we are, men, at Fort Moultrie. Now, with it. Brown! Wake up, soldier. This could mean your life. Now, you know, this is Fort Sumter. You've seen the new battery out there. Now, listen up. Got mines across the entrance to the harbor, and when these concrete emplacements are finished, they'll be spread out along Sullivan's Island, working together as a unit to give overlapping fields of fire. Now, this system's been on the drawing board for years, but it wasn't until the war with Spain lit a fire under Congress that we got the money to go ahead. Now, my job to teach you boys how to effectively use these weapons. This afternoon's session will be on the 4.7-inch Armstrong rapid fire gun. All right, men, take a break. 
The fort changed as new ideas came along, and in this time of automobiles, flying machines, and electricity, ideas were coming fast and furious. A new aiming system for better accuracy. Electric lights, and even searchlights to sweep the harbor. Then, World War I, and things got more serious. National Guard troops manned the big guns. Recruits being trained for overseas service, there were about 3,000 men here at Moultrie, the most there had ever been. America became the storehouse, pumping food and men into an exhausted Europe. And while the carnage was thousands of miles from any American city, the coastal batteries were manned and ready, ready to meet a challenge that would never come. sent to Pearl Harbor. I mean, I'm the professional soldier, damn it. You're just a crazy kid. Yeah, just always doing what your big brother did, you silly goof. You know, Mama, she misses you, Johnny. We all miss you. You know, Johnny, they... That requisition old man loses his fishing boat for coast patrols. Can you believe it? Old man Lewis. Yeah, but you should have seen him, Johnny. He was so proud. I haven't seen it in the newspapers yet, but Captain Thomas said he's seen tankers burning offshore. Now, there could be a, a German U-boat sitting out there watching me right this minute. The sport, though. It's useless, Johnny, unless we get overhead protection for the batteries and a submarine net. We're gonna be sitting ducks. You know, Johnny, they made me responsible for these new boys here. And I'll get them ready. I'll get them ready, Johnny. God, I hope we have enough time. Though the guns were manned during World War II, the greatest threat to our shores didn't come from surface vessels, but from submarines. Men and materials for global war funneled through ports like Charleston. Coordinating the movements of ships, 
the control of submarine nets and the directing of anti-submarine patrols, the fort helped keep the vital avenues of supply open. Ports and harbors, as points of invasion, were no longer critical. Armies could land anywhere with air protection and landing craft. The traditional seacoast fortification was no longer needed. In August of 1947, the Army lowered Fort Moultrie's flag for the last time. The uniforms change, but a soldier remains a soldier. For nearly 200 years, the old fort evolved changed to meet new threats, new technology, responded to new challenges, but finally, technology swept past the fort. Today, Fort Moultrie doesn't look like it did at any one particular time in the past, yet there are reminders here of almost 200 years of coastal defense. Our defenses are no longer at the water's edge. Today, they reach out across the oceans and into space itself. <laughs> 